I'll just start off with asking you each to introduce yourself, tell the audience a bit about your, your history and your company's history. Um, and maybe I'll start with you, um, Sam, if you don't mind. Oh, I get to go first. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I'm the co-founder of Axiomzen, which is Dapper Lab's parent company. Um, we launched it essentially uh, as a company to um, build other startups. So what we wanted to do is create a home for brilliant people to come together. So we assembled an all-star team of talent um, that would be able to work on you know, highly innovative projects. First, we would do work for hire work, um, you know, consulting gigs, things like that for big corporate clients, startups, enterprise companies, and things like that, and roll whatever profits we made from that into our own in-house projects. Um, like I said, what we wanted to do was work on highly innovative projects um, with cutting edge technology and software. Um, we wanted to experiment, refine, experiment some more, and hopefully create something that we could launch into the market and potentially spin out into its own company. Um, one of those companies ended up being uh, Dapper Labs. Um, and just like PCs and the internet unblocked huge opportunities for billions of people, we think that crypto and blockchain um, can do the same um, as we move into this new chapter of the internet. Um, so we started Dapper Labs to bring all of our Web3 and Metaverse work under the same umbrella. The first project of that was a little pro a little thing called CryptoKitties, um, digital cast that we launched back in 2017. And the main mission of Dapper today is to make the world more open um, and empowering for both creators and their communities. Um, so we really want to make sure we end up with an open metaverse that's owned by the people um, that can use it and add value to it. That's pretty awesome. Josh, let's hear a bit, a bit more about you. Yeah, I'm wearing my Crypto Kitty shirt today. See, old school, old school swag. Yeah, um, yeah. My name is Josh. Uh, been in. Uh, I'm from Northern BC, uh, and uh, I went into tech sort of later in life. Later being thirty, <laughs> that's later in life for me. Uh, and well, a, li a little bit of my twenties. So I've been in tech almost. Uh, I think I think almost twenty years now. Um, and uh, started in telecommunications and then moved into games, worked at a bunch of studios here. Um, back then, games were just PC games or console games, and actually PC were, were um, growing, moving away from console, and free-to-play was just starting. And so I quit my job and backpacked around the world and uh, came back and was playing a lot more casual games when I came back. So back then, there wasn't really a market for casual games, so we started um eSide games we've been around for it's our 11th year now and um making free-to-play games we started on facebook making games on open web and facebook um and back in the days being first to market and they're known in vancouver was really doing that everyone uh was saying don't do that it's a bad idea you'll fail you should just go back to having a publisher you shouldn't self-publish you shouldn't do that i mean we pivoted from there and uh, I became CEO of the company and my, my job, what I thought would be great was to have games that could play on any platform, which wasn't a great idea at the time, but now I think was a brilliant idea. So if I had that idea today, I'd be, uh, you know, everyone would say that's such a brilliant idea. And, uh, and then we just went to mobile games because this little company called Apple um, started having microtransactions in games. So we started doing mobile games. We've been doing mobile games ever since. And now we do have games on um, pretty much every platform, all free to play. Um, but what's interesting about, you know, the new world of games uh, is platforms are ever evolving. So we, you know, Netflix is now a publisher. We have a game on uh, Netflix is just free to play. Um, we've done some NFT stuff with our games. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah, games is a huge industry. Uh, and it's ever growing. And I think I read something today, and uh, I think it was on Georgia Strait that said, if you look at the VR aspect, um, if you just look at headcount, Vancouver is second in the world for for VR. So games and VR, Vancouver is a is a Vancouver and BC are are pretty big uh, footprints in the world. Um, yeah, that's me. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and yeah, when I was thinking about how this, this session was kind of framed, um, you know, we said it was entitled like how the metaverse will change everything, but it was kind of more like how how disruptive technologies and how everything can change everything and where, where those opportunities lie. I think now many people would say, you know, chat GPT is, is what that, that should have been replaced with or could be replaced with. Um, but each of your companies really have kind of leaned in to those paradigm shifts. And I think that's what's really interesting for the audience to learn from. Um, and Josh, as you said, um, I, you and I were talking earlier about some of the stats and, you know, for the mobile gaming market globally, uh, mobile game revenues now are, you know, account for 50% of the total global revenues. So surpassing the revenue of PC and console combined, but that's been a long, you know, that's all been a long journey to get to that point, I'm sure. So I don't know if you could maybe look back and share a bit more about your experience kind of leaning into that paradigm shift, were there challenges and opportunities of being first? There's definitely a risk in being first because sometimes there's not the infrastructure uh, to support it. And we're seeing that across, you know, games and, uh, you know, even in um, emerging technologies, metaverse stuff, that it's hard to get uh, mass user adoption so you can prove out concepts or monetize or um, grow that's really hard at the start until there's frameworks to support you so it does take some time um looking back what we've always thought of these side games is we will never really be first to market although we should have a product in but when you're first to market it's more about exploring so i think there's a there's it depends on your company culture but i always view it as first to market into a brand new ecosystem be that you know, uh, something new uh, or a new platform, you want to be there to learn from it, but it's going to take time to learn, make sure that you're, for me, just speaking from a game perspective, just because a game works really well on console doesn't mean the game is going to work really well on mobile. It doesn't mean because you have a great game on mobile, you can just tack on some things and say, now I'm making a game for I'm making a game in the metaverse like it's different games and it's a different experience and you got to figure out how your user is going to be able to get that experience from there but what I will say is you should view your products that you're building as um, additive to the brand so wherever you put that you're trying to build out your universe so you might not monetize your game well in uh, a we're seeing that a lot, like, for example, in Roblox, you're seeing a lot of people have micro games that are part of their brand, but maybe they're not monetizing on those games, but it's additive to bring you back to the game that does monetize on that could be on mobile, that could be on PC, that could be on uh, console. Sam, Josh mentioned it earlier, but obviously we are seeing kind of Vancouver and BC um, really as a global leader in interactive and digital media. Um, so maybe I should have posed the question at the top to you, how the metaverse will change everything, but um, more to the point of, of uh, kind of what Josh was saying, or were there, you know, how did your organization lean in and, and thrive during, you know, take advantage of that paradigm shift or, and how did you balance the risks or rewards? Um, anything you'd share there? I mean, Josh nailed it on the head. There's always a risk in being first. Um, and we knew that when we um, set about to, to explore um, Web3, um, what we needed to do or what we set out to do was use the uh, do a proof of concept, basically. And that was what, what, what CryptoKitties was. Um, so we needed to start with, you know, familiar, familiar things. Um, start off with a fun, quirky experience and experiment um, to see if there was any appetite for this, for this new tech. Um, and we wanted to prove or see if we could build uh, something that people could use um, to also prove to ourselves that NFT could be something real today. Um, and if there would be interest for, for mass consumers um, as well. Um, so we're seeing a paradigm shift now on the blockchain to get mainstream adoption to, to develop the tech. Um, obviously, um, it was a huge, huge learning experience for us. Um, it, it sort of blew up, went viral. Um, it was all over the news. Um, and, you know, we broke the Ethereum we, <laughs> uh, in the first, uh, first few weeks and months. Um, you know, transactions started being really slow. Consumer, uh, customers had to wait, you know, hours, sometimes days to get their NFT. Things were breaking all the time. So a lot of learning experience from us there. But the one main thing we figured out was clearly there's interest there. 
But to get you know hundreds of millions of people to use this thing, it needs to be seamless. It needs to be easier to use. Um, people can't wait, you know, even five minutes to get something that they paid for um, on the on the internet, right? Um, it needs to be quick. It needs to be instantaneous, um, and it needs to be easy to use, right? An ordinary consumer isn't gonna go, you know, set up a hardware wallet or get a uh, or sign up at an exchange, then fund that exchange with their credit card, then move the token, the um, the crypto from that wallet to another wallet to fund another wallet, um, and then that wallet to fund um, their account and the transaction. Um, so uh, we set about to, to fix those things and those experiences to make it as seamless and easy as possible for customers and consumers to use the technology, basically. So we launched Flow, um, we launched Dapper Wallet, um, we brought in credit card, the ability to just play, pay with your credit card and everything else will be done on the back end and the cu customer consumer wouldn't you know, have to be um, bothered with you know, setting up um, this and that and that. Um, so, I mean, we launched the thing back in 2017. Arguably, we're still working on it and we're still learning and we're, there's still new things that come up every day. Um, so, so it's a learning process, but um, we're getting there. Um, it, uh, we're going to the industry is sort of going through a hard time now because of all the all the press that's out there and things that are happening. Um, but it's clear that the interest is still there, that big brands are still interested in the technology and consumers as well. Um, so it's just doubling down on building and fixing those um, those problems that we have and and going from there. That's great. And I was I was interested, maybe if you could tell us a bit, you know, I was going to kind of ask you about some of the larger implications or business implications and opportunities that lie with this paradigm shift. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, like, what you're seeing with kind of the, the flow, um, you know, ecosystem that you're creating, what kind of, you know, what are the opportunities you've seen by developing that as an extension of the work you are doing? Yeah, I mean, flow was created to be the blockchain for for the masses. Um, it, it was created to be able to handle um... Oh, I think I might have just lost Sam. Hello? Sam, can you hear us? Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Awesome. Uh, Flow was <laughs> created to be able to, to handle uh, hundreds of millions of transactions, right? Um, it, it's supposed to be the blockchain for, for consumers and for, for the masses. Um, Again, uh, like we said, we encountered problems when we launched an Ethereum. Um, transactions became clogged, transactions became slow. Um, and so we set about to, to fix those issues by building. I mean, first we, we looked around to see what was out there and um, we didn't find anything that could, um, that, that appealed to us. So we set about to you know, build our own thing. Um, it took us a while to get there, but um, we launched Flow with, with bringing on board the MBA and creating MBA Top Shot. And just to demonstrate that the technology can work and can handle you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of users. Um, and then we saw with, um, and that's starting to pick up as well. Uh, legacy Ethereum projects are, are starting to, to lean in and to listen and hear what we have to say. Um, most recently, you know, we were in launch, uh, announced Doodles 2 launching on, on our platform on Flow. Um, that's super exciting. That's super fun. And there are a ton of others that we can't say yet, but stay tuned. Um, um, both uh, legacy Ethereum projects, but also brand new big brands, um, sports leagues, et cetera, that are still to come. So opportunity is still there. Um, not to toot our own horn, but we think Flow is the blockchain to th that can support um, millions of people if you want to appeal to to the masses. Um, so come on over. Great. Um, maybe I have a follow up question, but I'll maybe pose it to both of you, which is just around those big brand names. Like, is there is there a tipping point where you see some of the bigger brands lean in um, that gives you a sense of oh? Hope we haven't lost power here. <laughs> yeah, that 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 shows a, that paradigm shifts is taking off or gaining gaining ground. Um, have you seen that? I know Josh, you've had you've had lots of really big kind of like brand collaborations. So I'm curious on your perspective, like when big brands lean in, what is that telling us? Well, when IPs um, start combining, so I think there's there's two parts to that. One of them is 
um, IPs being able to work with someone on a platform um, and, you know, working with MBA, which is uh, arguably, you know, uh, online, one of the biggest, if not the biggest sporting IP, like just on Twitter, that article I shared with you yesterday that shows that, um, you know, uh, if you combined all the major sporting networks on Twitter, they don't equal what NBA followers have. So like they're a very online savvy community on, on that platform. So seeing uh, brands um, uh, collaborating, working in the metaverse, working in games is really interesting. But then to me, what's more interesting is Fortune 500 brands, big brands actually working. So I saw a demo. I just came back from Pocket Gamer in um, London. I saw a great demo from my friends at the Sandbox to look at um, sort of the virtual land that they have and the parties and uh, what they're doing there. And it's major brands that are investing in there. If that's, you know, Adidas or Time magazine, um, these are old school brands that are seeing uh, lasting value to to get their foot in the door to see like what's next. And I still think there's lots to, to speaking from the games entertainment side, there's still lots that needs to come from that. But the fact that it's getting started, we're still in the very early days of uh, uh, the metaverse. And I think another thing to talk about in the conversation is, especially once again, speaking from the game scene, it doesn't have to be this or that. It's additive. You can do both things in parallel. You can see how just because there's going to be a rise in entertainment and people um, focusing on the metaverse doesn't mean that's going to replace other forms of entertainment. It means it's going to be additive to the universe for consumers to pick where they want to uh, engage or consume. And I think sometimes our conversations or maybe conversations in media are driven towards, well, if this means uh this is coming it means it's going to cancel this that's not the case there's still comic books around even though there's comic books that are digitally not as good as a real comic book in my opinion but they're still around and and you can consume either or if you're still consuming that in the universe mm -hmm. but there's still movies about marvel characters there's still games about that that's additive um mm -hmm. you can do explorations in the metaverse on 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 comic books it's all additive to the same um, entertainment universe. Yeah, it goes hand in hand. Like uh, you can have one and the other as well. Um, and like with NFTs too, there there's some companies and projects out there that um, you can buy an NFT, buy the NFT, and at the same time you get access to the physical thing. And anytime you can redeem the NFT for the physical object as well, so the NFT will disappear here and you'll get the physical object or you can just hang on to the nft and trade the nft and the physical object that goes along with with the nft but i think right now crypto or the blockchain in general has a trust problem that's been you know the result of some bad actors in the industry and products that have been built around speculation mainly versus you know fun and consumer experiences and we're going through a crypto winter and feeling like greater macro you know economic impacts ac across the entire industry um, but I think you're going to go. You're going to see better and stronger products coming out of this. Um, this is when companies and, and startups, in particular, um, who are focused on being, you know, customer first and building that company, have great runway ahead of them and continue to innovate can truly shine. Um, and the NFT space, in particular, as these speculative projects that have been running for for a while, you know, shake out and fizzle out. Um, you get more established brands like Doodles um, demonstrating to mainstream audience that utility could be real in, in this space. Um, and that's always been the focus of ours from day one. And, and what we're trying to do and what I think more people need to do is build for our communities. That's great. That's a good segue into kind of the next question I was going to pose, which is to, to ask your thoughts on how businesses across industries might think to utilize these new technologies whether to you know, engage their community, enhance experiences, or, or drive better business results. Um, uh, I'm curious to, to hear your perspectives um, on what you're seeing that's interesting or, or where you think the, the ripest opportunities um, might lie, um, but happy to maybe come to you first, on so, Josh. Yeah, this is always a great question. It could be a talk in itself, but I think also because lots of people um, you know, maybe I'm skipping ahead in the question, but it's also important to remember just because it's a new 
opportunity, new technology to always make sure like whatever product, whatever entertainment game uh, app you're making is right for the um, the environment. So just because it's a new product, it doesn't mean, and I think that's why we're seeing lots of, uh, well, there's many reasons, but there's many bad actors, but also like products that don't really fit in, in, in this area because people are just rushing to make anything they're just throwing that technology on rather than than um adding to it so just make sure like whatever you're making it makes sense and this is the right place for it because what's great about right now i think we're in a fantastic time uh especially if you are a startup or if you're an entrepreneur there's never been a time or just even a hobbyness there's never been a time that with uh, a laptop or a tablet you could enter one of these worlds and do everything from having a hobbyist store in a Roblox or a sandbox box making some stuff to going out and starting uh, um, making uh, apps and tools to be additive to this, to, to launching or making your own uh, store or venture. Uh, and you could do that without a, without a huge team. Tools exist. You can do that. You just got to make sure that it's really additive. So, so my answer to that is just make sure you're doing it because um, playing in uh, or working in this space makes sense for your business versus launching something uh, that's an app or launching something just um, that you could just launch on uh, good old internet because the, it can grow into something bigger, but it doesn't always have to go to whatever the newest thing is. And, and that's where I think people paint themselves in the corner because they're like, I have to do something with blockchain make sure you need that as a core part of your business and you're not just bolting it on or else you're going to get back to remember back in the days everyone wanted to gamify everything and if they don't really have a good structure or a good idea of where they want to get there um that's just not going to be a fun game it's going to be like when we had all the ceos in the 80s doing like rap videos just because that was the, that was the trend and they were always horrible but we want to make sure that it really, uh, you know, as a when you think of your business, you just really want to make sure that you're you're pushing forward in the right vertical that makes sense to your business and your end customers. And mm -hmm. if not, then you pivot and you look for what actually works. Sam, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and I think um, I'll call them industrial companies are starting to also catch up to the potentials of the tech. Um, I mean, I'll take insurance as an example, one industry that's known for not being that innovative. Um, you know, how many freaking forms, uh, forms you have to fill out every time you want to do something and stuff like that. But they're starting to explore it. They're starting to see how blockchain can benefit um, and remove, you know, the, the, the risk of fraud and, and things like that. You have companies like Boeing and Honeywell who are using blockchain to track aircraft parts and do maintenance for the aircrafts, right? Um, so the, the interest is there, and these companies are also recognizing the, the big benefits that the technology can bring, um, even with NFTs. Um, in terms of the metaverse, um, I think AR uh, is going to be huge. Um, I mean, there are already a billion AR-ready devices worldwide. You know, most smartphones now support AR applications. Um, I think NFTs could be a natural evolution of that. And one that could like they could unlock new visual effects to create more connected experiences around people. Um, never underestimate the power of mobile, right? People mobile first has been the strategy of any consumer facing company or should be the strategy of any consumer facing company. Um, and uh, I think it should be baked into your strategy from the onset. Um, my two cents. Yeah, that the, the uh, AR, VR, um, part of it there's so many if you're starting a business now or you're looking to augment um or pivot look at how many uh industries still do stuff the same way they've done it for tens or hundreds of years like uh cars i was blown away to see most of the car models they make are in clay like they're making these in they're physically making these in clay or another material and then they're testing aerodynamic flows and looking at them and then seeing if they're good and then doing that and and i think this can be additive to it as well because you can look at how you can speed up the efficiencies or do modifications really quickly i know unity is doing that in town here just like really cool stuff 
um, like that. So I think it's going to be uh, additive. I think people get freaked out right away because they're like, they're going to change the entire industry. It's going to be additive to the industry. It's going to be able to uh, allow more people to have uh, input. We're going to be able to move quicker and especially BC being a very uh, strong technology backbone. It's going to create a lot of jobs. Well, I see we do have a couple of questions in the chat. I might pose my last one that I have um, to the two of you and then we'll, we'll grab those, those questions from the chat. Um, but, um, cause I know you have a, maybe, have a fair bit to maybe say on this last question, which is just, you know, knowing we have a you know, diverse audience, but I know many small, medium-sized companies on the call today. Um, what are some of your key words of wisdom um, on how they should be kind of looking at the current market, uh, how they can really try and accelerate their growth or learn from, from your experiences? Um, and so it's a bit broad. I'm, I'm open to you taking it into the direction you'd like to, but really words of wisdom for, for the folks on the call today. Josh, you're unmuted, so you're first. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the the words of wisdom are the, mine are probably super boring because it's what we've kind of done forever at ESA Games is just bootstrap as long as you can. Um, make sure you're really looking at your, your MVP for what you wanna make and make sure that there really is a customer base for what you're making. Um, and it's okay if there isn't. Sometimes you're making stuff because you think it's a great idea and then this becomes a hobby project you put on the side. But I think so many people, uh, I think it's dangerous in this, in this where we're at right now uh, in the world to go out and raise a lot of money and then come up with an idea on what you wanna do. I think it's better to, really zero in on what you wanna make and why and what your direction is and what your focus is, uh, and then prove that out. And then if you can support yourself, continue to do that and or looking at raising money. Um, and the reason being is just, you give up so much when you raise money right off the bat. Um, you do de-risk, but you do give up a lot of that. But but that's just the way I've done it. Could be the totally wrong way. Um, but um, that's what I would suggest if you're small and you want to kind of, own your own destiny. When you bring in all of those, when you bring in that um, money right away, your direction is going to be definitely guided by people that gave you that money. So you can't move as quick. So you got to weigh those two things out. I'm going to bring it to Sam, but I might ask Sam for your perspective on, on what Josh just shared. Um, Cause I know you've kind of shared with me before, you know, some of those early investors um, were really important to your journey. Um, and I'm also curious, maybe just for the audience, you know, was it challenging uh, bringing on investors when you were kind of in a new space? You know, what, what can others kind of learn from your experience? You know, I, I completely agree with Josh. Like we were bootstrapped until, you know, seven years into the, the lifetime of the company, right? Um, and we only went out to raise funding only when we had to and only when we, um, um, decided that the vision we have, we need help to 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 get there. Um, we need resources, we need backing, we need introductions, and so that it, it was a logical choice for us to do that. And even when we decided to do that, um, we promised ourselves that we would only bring on board people who were aligned with our vision and what we wanted to do. Um, even today, um, our board is completely supportive of the decision that we've made and the decision that we're going to be doing or making in the future, right? So it's surrounding yourself with like-minded um, people. And, and granted, I know um, a lot of the times people don't have that choice. Um, and sometimes they have to raise money to save their company. And, and, and that, that's all well as well. Um, but if you if you don't have to, don't do it. And if you have to, um, be very strategic about how you do it, basically. Um, and then secondly, I mean, I think the biggest thing for us was um, find other people interested in your vision. Right, the team is going to be extremely important from from the early days of your company. Um, and in the early days, you're not going to have that much money to to throw around to to bring you know executive VPs and and folks like that on board. Um, so find people who believe in your vision, who are aligned with your vision. Our first employee, Pierre, um, you know, was working at big uh, enterprise companies and was just done with that lifestyle, believed in the vision that Roham and I had and decided to come on board with us. Um, 
Mac, who was also I think Josh's buddy, um, um, made tons of introductions for us in terms of talent, right? So make sure you build out your network too. Um, I can't overemphasize that enough. Um, and then build your culture around that core team um, and make sure it evolves with you and try not to forget your roots and where you came from. I wasn't trying to spark. Oh, also, sorry. also, don't underestimate the power of grants um, and, and government support too. Um, and, and, um, and folks like uh, BC Tech, uh, Frontier Collective, things like that. Like, use the uh, use those those um, those avenues for for support. But also, there are tons of grants out there, tons of support from government too. I think there could still be a little bit more, but um, it's a lot better than it was ten years ago, at least. So. Yeah, and like uh, if you're in if you're in gaming or you're in the space, join BC Tech and we have a C council that we meet up. I mean, that's one of, that's one thing I wish I found a lot earlier on in when we were starting is being able to talk to other uh, founders, C-level people to really like ask these questions or have these, these discussions to really like understand how you do that. If, especially when you're starting out and you're bootstrapped, you, you don't have the luxury of going to every conference and meeting every person, but maybe somebody can make an introduction with you um, in that network. Well, I think what's special about BC is, is we actually all talk and share information and um, all grow together. And if you look at where this space was, uh, you know, tech space, metaverse, gaming space, you look at this space, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, uh, it was all big companies, not from BC siloed. And now we've seen lots of homegrown companies that have come through. Some have sold and uh, been part of other companies. And then those founders go back into the ecosystem and do other things. And and that's unique that you can have access to, to talk to one of the founders of a thinking ape uh, or to talk to somebody that's been successful and worked through all cycles of, of games and technology and and be able to learn from them. Thanks, Josh. I dropped a quick note in the chat. People, feel free to send us an email. The next meeting um, is on February 15th. Uh, we'll be downtown um, at North Point Brewery. So shoot us a note and uh, we'll make sure you get that, that meeting invite. Um, and yeah, our sea councils are a great space. We have 14 different sea councils who, who meet throughout the year. They meet quarterly. And it's fascinating to hear the conversations those business leaders have um, together in those peer-to-peer -peer groups and how much they can learn and gain from, from each other's experiences. Um, so I'll maybe go to the, the chat. There's a few questions here. Um, and you guys can kind of jump in as appropriate. Uh, but uh, Samson says, more so last year, but it seems like the general mainstream gaming journalism space is against uh, crypto Web3 features and games. Uh, did you find that a challenge or is this even something you are concerned about when going mainstream? Of course, we love all publications and all journalists and they are, they are fantastic and they're our best friends. Um, that being said, uh, uh, I think you, I think as spaces grow, you'll also see um places that talk about places will specialize to talk about certain verticals um so places that don't agree with uh where uh, games or entertainment are going are going to have that feature on their side but you'll want to focus on the publications that are going to grow and talk about talk about that space i mean the same thing happened in mobile same thing happened in facebook games they're both huge verticals but traditional gaming publications those aren't the games they play. So it's not gonna make sense for them to report on that. But then you have, you know, entire events now that are just about mobile games. Like Pocket Gamer is, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest in the world. And they have a conference that are just all about mobile games. But now what's interesting with it is um, now they also have a Web3 metaverse component, a whole day on just that. They have a whole day on PC games. They have a whole day on VR, AR. So uh, I think that's just showing as we go through what's next in entertainment that it's 
there's going to be publications that specialize in that, but, but these streams of entertainment aren't going to stop. They're only going to grow. You don't have to pick. I think there's a, a notion of pick. If you pick one, then the other one replaces that. They're all going to exist at the same time. And if you choose uh, one over the other, that's fine. Or you can choose to consume entertainment in multiple um, channels of those, but it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, there's always going to be. I love how Josh said we love all publications and all media. We do. Um, and and everyone's entitled to their own opinions. And some of it is going to be fluff and some of it is going to be true. Um, but I mean, we can only focus on what we're focusing on and double down um, on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, there is an, a lot of interest from, from uh, I'll call them again, legacy gaming companies and, and what Web3 can, can accomplish, um, specifically in the NFT space. I think Ubisoft has, has built something already, not on Flow, but at least it's on, it's on the blockchain. There are others who are talking with us and actively exploring um, uh, and trying to come up with ideas or things they can build on Flow or other chains. Um, so uh, there's still interest. Um, I don't think they're wrong that three years ago, four years ago, when we first launched, there was a lot of skepticism in, in what could be done in the space. Um, I think we've proved a lot of people wrong. Um, I think we still have a lot of work to do to, to show that um, there's something uh, tangible here, um, but we're on the right track. Yeah. A um, couple more questions. Um, got a question here about the home buying process. So uh, what do you think of gamification of home buying process? Is the metaverse ready for the real estate industry? Are you gonna buy your next house virtually? <laughs> That would be uh, as a as a real estate fan. I'm, I'm in my free time. I just like to look up, you know, home home prices in Vancouver because you know, who doesn't like to see, you know, dream of that um, home that they can own in the West Side that's like multi million dollars. And yeah, um, that aside, um, I think there there's a lot of opportunities in the real estate space, real estate space, and there are companies actively working on uh, as well in the space. Uh, there's a company called uh, Ratium, I believe, um, who are also building on Flow. Just a little plug for them. Um, but you know they're trying to um, they're trying to build a real estate marketplace utilizing NFTs and the blockchain, and they want to enable everyone to have the ability to invest in real estate. I'm starting with something as simple as like a hundred dollars and you get a little piece of of um of of, of something there. Um huh. and then investors will share rental income and appreciation through fractional ownership, basically. Um, I think the challenge there is for the leg regulatory landscape to catch up. As we know, government is slow to um to understand and and um adapt new technologies and approve of new, new tech. So it's just doubling down on educating them on the benefits and also helping them create some sort of framework there to also protect um, people who are gonna be using these platforms, right? It shouldn't just be a free for all. There should be some sort of um, regulatory framework there um, in order to let people um, use the platform, but also protect them as well. I think so. Yes, there's a lot of potential, but also, um, yeah, the, on the government side, regula regulations need to catch up as well. Josh, any thoughts there? Yeah, I just wouldn't want to buy, I wouldn't want the, to get my uh, home vacancy tax on my NFT from the city of Vancouver and I'll have a big bill that I'll have to pay there. I don't know. It's the only thing I'd watch. I mean, any place that you could look at it's a good example on um, disrupting, uh, look at places where technology can uh, streamline this process and disrupt it. Like I just went through um, uh, selling my condo and looking for a new place. And it's like, and we did this kind of in the pandemic times and it's so not set up for um, digital. <laughs> it's like all paper, pen on ink. And it's like, it, 
it's absolutely insane. Buying a car is kind of the same thing from a lot on how you figure it out, although some some startups have figured out how to streamline that. But but buying a home is one of those things that's just over-regulated and not streamlined. And I think somebody's eventually going to figure that out. Right now, you always start with, I mean, we were the city that didn't have Uber for how long, right? Uber and Lyft, where it's like, it can't be done. So I, I think people that break into these spaces uh, are going to see uh, that they're going to see a uh, big opportunity. Once again, the challenge is, do you, that's where you might have to raise. So you have the funds to really work with government to look at regulation versus after the regulation is added, could you be second or third to market and be a lot of a smaller piece, but not spend as much on kind of figuring out what those regulations are. But all of this is coming. I think what the, what open worlds have, open worlds aren't new, they've been around forever. But what open worlds give you um, is um, a new way to collaborate, a new way to collaborate with um, where, who you're going to do business with, uh, where you're going to work, um, and another way that we can all communicate together. It's still in its early stages, but I don't think that's going away. Great. Um, we have two additional questions kind of in looking at other areas. So one is asking, you know, how will Metaverse change the job market and the hiring process? And the other asking Metaverse and education, where is it heading? Um, and so I think it's kind of, you know, these are just building on, you know, where are, where are the opportunities? And as you said, I think both of you, um, you know, there's many places where you can look for opportunities. Um, is either you care to comment further specifically on those two, the job market hiring process or education, anything that you've seen? Um, or any other uh, examples. I know Josh, we had talked about, I think a voting um, application as well. So I think it's just interesting to see there's so many different um, areas we could explore. Yeah, that's Lawrence at uh, One Feather. So they have, a, I was on their podcast and they just have an amazing, they use a blockchain to uh, enable indigenous people to, uh, to vote, especially in rural communities and to, to uh, identify and to be able to vote um, streamlessly, uh, with which which is a big problem to tackle, and I think that's amazing. And I think with uh, education and with job, or it's bringing more of the challenge with BC and with most of Canada is it's focused around the cities. So if you live in the city, you're you have access to um, resources, um, you can go to schools, classes, and it's more immersive. And I think what we can do with this technology is be able to bring some of that to other areas of the province or to people that normally wouldn't have that to be able to be, to be able to access things like training, I think are really important, especially, uh, as we look at, um, uh, all of the different resources. So it's not just technology, but training in forestry, training in, uh, uh, natural resources, that sort of stuff, but also in education, just to be able to bring more comprehensive learning modules outside of just a Zoom call that you could be really immersive in and work seamlessly with someone. It doesn't matter where you are, but you can all work collaboratively, especially in uh, AR, VR, um, and work together on that. So I think we're starting to see some of that uh, come forward it's still in the early stages. The barriers, obviously, the equipment to make sure that people can get equipment to be able to work on that. But, but that's all coming down in price, and and we're seeing more and more collaboration. Silver lining of the pandemic, if there can be one, is we we all had to figure out ways that we can work uh, from home and figure that out. So people have been thinking about those problems where you don't have to have a you know, a green screen screen room in a warehouse that has to be 15 meters by 15 meters with no one around it for you to actually collaborate and work. You have to figure out how to do that in someone's bedroom and how to collaborate with somebody else streamlessly on that. So these are mm -hmm. all problems, but they're also excellent opportunities if you want to enter the space and help solve those by, by making the shovels and pickaxes. Yeah, and like as a, as a kid, I wasn't the, the best learner. I would say I rebelled a little bit. I hated um, 
like just reading textbooks and, and things like that in class. Um, but imagine, um, like if, if I was that, if I was um, back in, you know, middle school or whatever, and I was putting on these glasses and I was walking through ancient Persia or ancient Egypt or ancient Rome and just learning about, you know, the Colosseum and the pyramids and, and you know, the history surrounding those and I could see it um, um, up close and maybe even touch it or experience it or feel it. Um, it could have been a lot more um, stimulating, I would say, um, versus just text on a, on a, in a classroom, just reading through or seeing pictures and whatnot. So I think there's there's a lot of potential in the education space. I think some countries are already starting to experiment with it, like Japan, I think, um, more so with with virtual classrooms. Um, but I think you know, um, the virtual uh, field trips are also going to become a thing, right? Um, take a tour of um, ancient Rome, for example, or whatever it is. Um, that could be really interesting and really cool. Um, and and like Josh mentioned, the tech is getting better, um, and um, there's a slew of companies already working on it. So um, you know, the next few years are going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, nothing will replace nothing will replace grade eight, and they pull out that that big crappy CRT movie, and then they put in like the old VHS on like Welcome to Space, and you get to watch that for thirty minutes, and everyone sleeps in class. Like we have to be able to bring that experience to kids, and then I think we're good. Yeah. Um, I think we had one more. I was about to check. I think we had one more question. Um, Aldwin, you had your hand up. Did you still want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it was kind of just curiosity more than anything, um, because you guys are both in gaming. Um, do you guys see each other as a competitor or do you guys kind of look at each other and see, hey, that product is really good. Um, I got to do a better one or or do you guys ever thought about collaborating with each other or, you know, does that even happen? I, I guess because um, um, I'm just curious because I'm in, in the web development uh, field and I was wondering if I go to a company, am I, am I stuck there doing the same thing kind of over and over again? Does, does that make sense or? Yeah, thanks so much, Alva. Yeah, it's pretty collaborative in, uh, I mean, I think everyone's doing such different types of games that you tend to specialize right away. Like at ESA Games, we do mostly narrative idle games. Not many other people do that. So even if we work with an IP, it's gonna be a much different project uh, product than um, if Sam makes a game in that space or if Sam does something in that space. Even if I worked with, with NBA, it would be a much different space than if EA made an NBA game or Sam made an NBA. Um, interactive um, game like it, it's just I think brands have lots of stories to tell and it's an it's a much different space you could be in the same space but it's a much different story think about like you know uh Walking Dead uh The Last of Us and 28 Days Later they're all kind of like I'm watching zombie shows but they're all a little bit different they're all part of a little bit different universe and you get a different experience from them and if you work for a if you work for a company or you went into that space, I think what's really interesting about the gaming ecosystem in BC and even the tech ecosystem is so many people are working on so many different projects and products that you could work for. You could go in and work at EA, but you could be working on more of the web component of what they're doing, or you could be working in live games or or even live ops, which is is just a new area that's really, came up where we make living games versus just making games. so even in a game studio there's so many different verticals you can work in we actually have web designers that work just with doing some of our interactive design and it's it, you know game companies or tech companies and tech companies are working on multiple products all the time and they need multiple disciplines all the time so you're working on a whole bunch of different stuff all the time but you're specializing in just maybe one area Yeah, um, Josh nailed it. I think it was, it's a pretty collaborative environment, and we would love Josh to also build his next game on Flow. So yeah, that would be awesome too. 
Um, but um, yeah, and we're, we as a company as well don't do one thing, right? We, we have uh, the games that we build and the entertainment experience that we build. We have the technology in the back end that we're building. Um, we have the wallet piece. So there's a lot of verticals inside of a company as well of different things to do and, and people can shuffle around. Um, and you know, learn different things and move around too. Um, and in terms of you know, com competition in the space, I think any blockchain project at this point becoming a success is a win for everyone. Because um, our mission is to show that the technology can work and consumers can mass consumers can use it. Um, so if there's a successful project out there, it's good for everyone. It shows more people that this is something tangible and. Um, and something people can actually use on, and play with. And so, yeah, we don't consider um, Josh or any other gaming company a direct competitor, no. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alvin. Um, I'd have one last live question. Uh, I think that's so chill. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for this. It's been super informative. Um, I question about the metaverse and this is just kind of going to piggyback on the question about where is it heading in terms of education and just made me think how do you see um the metaverse adapting an inclusive environment for people with disabilities or do you see like that's something that's already been that's already been so the question is yeah yeah did you guys get that Okay, awesome. Sam, maybe come to you first in terms of the metaverse and, and inclusivity and is this something that's already being tackled or is it something that can you know, be a part of what you're building? I think it's it's being explored. Um, I think, like I said, the, the opportunities are still out there. Um, in terms of um, you know, if someone has a disability or isn't able to attend class, for example, um, for them to join this um, online metaverse experience could be a lot more fulfilling than just you know hopping on a Zoom call and staring from their laptop um, at at the class and then all their peers there. Um, so that's one aspect of it that could be quite interesting. Um, and in terms of for other people with disabilities who can't go to class and things like that as well, it could be quite uh, quite interesting to see. Um, I know that um, they're experimenting with things in Japan and like they've run some studies and, you know, people showed that, you know, a metaverse is more of a class than any online, anything like in a simple online class can, can offer. So um, I think the opportunities are quite um, there and I'm quite uh, interested to explore those. Um, Arguably, I would have our company focus on some of those things as well. It's just like there's so many things we can do in so little time. So, yeah. Yeah, much like gaming, I uh, agree with everything Sam said. And, and I think the world and entertainment opening up uh, is also a great uh, area that we're going to see continue to grow. The challenge, much like in gaming too, is the hardware. So being able to have hardware for um, people uh, to be able to uh, enjoy it has to catch up, although we're seeing some of the hardware manufacturers for for the physical hardware to be able to make sure that it's open for everyone that's coming. Um, gaming is a good example of that. It's taken, well, 15 years, but it's it's tackling more and more inclusivity all the time. If you want to learn more about that or see like the stuff that they're building, look at the um, latest stuff that um, Microsoft and Sony are putting out. They're putting out some pretty cool stuff to to really embrace that, uh, to include more people into gaming. And I think with Metaverse, same thing. Because not everyone can wear, can um, uh, be able to uh, navigate um, the same as everyone else through headsets or, or uh, AR, VR, or laptop. We have to make sure that that hardware exists as well. So. Um, that's all being worked on, and uh, I'm excited to see what they build. Um, 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 um.